Good morning, my dear BAML friends. It's wonderful to be with you again today, and I want you to know what this connection has meant to me during this very unusual year. Today marks, I think, my 50th sermon at BAML for 2020 on into the first four months of 2021. And it's also my last sermon, at least for a while. I'm sure there will be times for us uh, down the future, maybe the not too distant future. But at least for now, I'm gonna have to turn my attention toward my responsibilities at Pepperdine. I have a big event coming up May 26th. Usually every day there are thousands of believers who go to the Malibu campus of Pepperdine. We have the Harbor Bible Lectures that I run, that I host there. But for the second year in a row, COVID is depriving us of the chance of being there in person. So it'll be a one-day event. I'll try to make sure that there's a link made available to you. Uh, all day long, we'll have words for Christians, especially for Christian leaders, from people like N.T. Wright and Scott McKnight and somebody writing on leadership in churches named Todd Bolsinger, Landon Saunders, Randy Harris, Rick Atchley, and so on. Some of my favorite people to listen to. But anyway, that's going to grab my attention here for a while. I just wanted you to know, though, what a blessing you've been to me. This started back in January of 2020. I preached quite a bit before in 2019. But in 2020, those first three or four Sundays, I think four, where I did a series on joy, and we had no idea what was coming down the pike. But it turns out God's been faithful and there has been joy even in the midst of the many sorrows and trials of 2020 and now 2021. But I've come to know something about the heart of this church. I love who you are. Wonderful days are ahead. I hear so much talk in churches about getting back together. And I want to say, but you know, it's not just about reconvening people. It's about re-envisioning, restoring, renewing, thinking with new dreams about what God has in mind for his people in this community. And I'll be praying for you and with you. And I'll look forward, I, I hope, not before long, when I can actually come down to Houston and be with you in an assembly. Well, our text today is Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. This last little series I'm doing is called Faith Over Fear. There have been so many fears this year and they continue into the uncertainties ahead of us. But we saw the importance the first week of being in the boat with Jesus and recognizing he's there. He will never leave you or forsake you. His love and his presence are constant. We validated that by jumping back into the Old Testament last week, into the book of Habakkuk, where Habakkuk says in those poignant words at the end of his his book, that even though everything goes south, there are no figs, no crops, no cattle, nothing, yet I will rejoice in God my Savior. This third week is a little different because I want to think about the church in the context of faith over fear. I don't have to address my fears alone. God's put me among a certain people. And it's part of what I wanted to say on this 50th sermon, and the last one for now, that you are not alone. I know it's important for churches to have some kind of hybrid exposure in the future, the, the in-present assemblies and the online assemblies, but I can't help believe that for most of us, we need, as soon as we can, as soon as it's safe, we need to be back together we need the flesh and blood encouragement. We need our small groups, our classes. We need to pray together, encourage together, and dream about being on mission for God together. Well, listen to the text, Ecclesiastes 7, chapter 4 and verse 7. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone he had neither son nor brother, 
There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes weren't content with his wealth. For who am I tolling? he asked. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Let's pray together. Oh God, though I know this is not what Ecclesiastes is talking about, I can't help but think the cord of three strands that is the eternal community of you, God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And no wonder you created a world in which humans are bound together in meaning and love and deep community. Today, God, as we think about facing our fears, our trials, our sufferings together, I pray that you'll pour through me the gift of preaching. May these old words spark new imaginations of how we may remain connected and blessed in the presence of others. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Back in Genesis, when God creates, there's this redundant refrain. God saw it, said it was good. God saw it and said it was good. He keeps saying that. But have you ever thought about everything that encompasses? Rattlesnakes, scorpions, mosquitoes, cats. Sorry, just lost the cat people there. All of these things God created, many of which we might not say sound like a blessing. Skunks. God blessed it and said, it's good. Okay. Mosquitoes, rattlesnakes, skunks. Turnips, poison ivy, poison oak, fire ants. On and on the list goes of things we might imagine that received the blessing of God. God saw it, and it was good, and he blessed it. He's trying to make the point that it feels like the bar was pretty low for God saying it's good. Lots of stuff I might not list under good that receives those words from God. But the place where God draws the line is when he looks out and sees Adam alone. And and it isn't that Adam wasn't married. This isn't a marriage text per se. And it's not that Adam's not having sex. It's, It's that he's alone. Sometimes I've heard people say, all we need is God. That's all you need in this world. He's the only one you need. And while I appreciate the sentiment, that's not God's opinion. (laughs) One of my rules in life is try not to be more spiritual than God. No, God saw Adam alone and said, "That's that's not good. God didn't whisper down, Adam, I'm all you need. Ultimately, that would be true. But in dealing with life, with its changes, its uncertainties, its fears, it's not good to be alone. It's true that our deepest longings for God, that no one can fill us like God can, but that doesn't mean that he is all we need. We were fashioned by God to need community, to depend on friends, to rely on family. I'm not a Lone Ranger. I'm not up to it. And and it doesn't really matter here whether I'm an extrovert or an introvert. In part of my life, I'm a bit of an extrovert, but quite often I'm an introvert. I find myself being recharged 
when I'm alone, when I have time to reflect and rest and do something by myself, but I'm not made just to be alone. It's not an introvert, extrovert thing. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, this is such a timely word. Because many of us are going the other way. Already we were going the other way. We found a way to eat alone, got drive through windows. We don't have to go to the movies anymore. It's all there online. There's Netflix, there's Amazon Prime. And now because of the coronavirus, major movies are just home streamed. You don't even have to go get your popcorn at a movie theater. We're finding ways through the easy accessibility of the internet to kind of be isolated. Even if in some ways we're playing to a larger crowd, lots of friends on Instagram, lots of people that we're connected to, but those are not necessarily the kind of people you call when you need somebody late in the afternoon just to talk through life with, or somebody to talk you down from the ledge when your anxieties and fears have gotten out of hand. You know, the writer of Ecclesiastes says that it's not good for us to be alone. He's reiterating what was there back in Genesis. And so he describes this this lone wolf out there. There was a man all alone, had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil. And yet his eyes were never content with his wealth. And so we picture this guy, high achiever, probably receives lots of affirmation. People call to get his opinions. People drop his name in conversations. The big boss keeps tossing him perks just to keep him from jumping ship. But like so many, he has less and less time to spend those perks. Lots of money that can be spent on medicine and therapy to help deal with his overcrowded life. Two million frequent flyer miles, but no place and no time to go. His life is his job, whether it's sales or medicine or preaching or teaching, coaching, whatever it may be. He's just climbing, climbing, climbing. And occasionally, the Ecclesiastes writer says, he will pause and say, Who am I doing all of this toiling for? Because in a moment of truth, he realizes all of his relationships go just about two inches deep. So the writer says, pity the man. When he hits the wind shear of some crisis, he's going to be solo piloting. When he steps into the fears that come down at us in life, he'll have to face them alone instead of in the power and the comfort of friends. I just read a powerful article in the Wall Street Journal by a geriatric psychiatrist who said that in the midst of the quarantine, a new study has come out and it appears that a greater danger to our mortality than smoking, obesity, and physical inactivity is loneliness. That loneliness isn't just a kind of sadness. It's bad for us. It's not good to be alone. God was right. It's not good for humans to be alone. And and that's not saying you have to be married. It's not saying you have to have children and grandchildren and so on, but you cannot be alone. We weren't made, we weren't built to be alone. And especially as a geriatric psychiatrist, he was concerned about all of those elderly people who didn't have access to their faith community, to their friends, to their natural connections during COVID-19. It just reinforced that we've got to find new ways to reach out and we've got to have new ways to let people in. It is not healthy to be alone. Pity that person, the writer says. We just weren't made to be that way. And so he talks about, notice he said, two are better than one. In other words, community is better than isolation. 
and here's what happens when you're with two or more people. First of all, you have someone to pick you up. That's his first observation. If you fall, you need someone to help you up. Don't you know we've all fallen a few times? Life's hard. It's not hard every day, but overall, life is hard. Maybe it's something that's happened to us, a health issue, victim of a crime, business partners turned on us, victim of downsizing, decisions made by your children that hurt you, something traumatic happened in your life, something. COVID-19 quarantine, anybody? But eventually something will upend you. You'll be flat on your back. And boy, is it good to have somebody reach down and pull you up. One of my dearest friends in life is 84 years old. His name's Landon Saunders. Landon told me that to him, the mark of a friendship is if you're lying on your back and you've just made a mistake you never could have imagined you would make. When you open your eyes, whose face would you want to see? So pity the man who's alone. But blessed is the man, the woman, who goes through life with a community, with a group of people, with friends. You're not alone. You're on your back, and there are people down there with you, helping you up, making sure you go on. Second, having other people means you'll stay warm. And don't you love this image of sleeping alone versus sleeping with somebody? You heard that as I read that in the text. I remember back when our uh, second son was just a little boy. He'd go with us to watch his older brother play baseball in the spring games. Well, we'd usually go early, and if he had the late game, you know, it'd be fine. We'd catch some of the early game. But very often, spring games in Abilene, the 6 o'clock game is nice and warm. The sun's still up, and so you'd go, and you'd maybe wear a long sleeve and have a light jacket just in case. But then the 8 o'clock game comes, and before you know it, Temperatures drop 20 miles an hour and the wind is picked up. I have this funny memory of Diane and I fighting over who got to hold Christopher in our lap. You, know, you make it sound like, oh, I want to be helpful. Let me hold him in my lap. But the truth is, you want the warmth. There's a body there to keep you warm. There was a famous band that recognized that truth. Their name came from stories about Australian Aborigines who would sleep with their dogs to get warm. And apparently, according to the story, you'd know how cold the night was by how many dogs it took. And if it was a really cold night, it would be a, well, you know, a three-dog night. And the writer of Ecclesiastes says, you need community to stay warm. Now, in, in the wake of the Me Too movement, I know there's a, lots of nervousness about touch and being inappropriate, and that's so good, such an important thing for the church to do its own evaluation of. But the kind of touch of friends, the kind of embrace that's wanted, an incarnational moment, a welcome word, a welcome handshake, a welcome hug, that's an essential part of life. God saw it's not good to be alone. It's part of why I just think we cannot imagine a world in the future where we don't need the church. Of course we do. These are the people that share our values that we're doing life with. Someone who welcomes you, embraces you, and warms your life. And then third in the text, he mentions that when you have community, you have someone to protect you. You don't go at it alone. You, you have someone to get your back, somebody to watch your six so that you're not exposed, somebody at your back, somebody at your side, people who are with you, which is how true community, true friendship works. You've got somebody to protect 
your reputation. You've got somebody to remind you that you believe when you're not sure. Somebody to pray for you when you don't have a prayer. Somebody to intubate you when your anxieties are so great you feel like you can't breathe. They'll just breathe for you. That's why I think the New Testament almost obsesses on all of those one another passages. Especially Paul writing to the church about being together as the body of Christ. He'll say, love one another, serve one another, accept one another, welcome one another, counsel one another, bear one another's burdens, on and on and on, because you are not alone. You're not alone. You are with others. Do this with one another. That younger son, the one that I said we fought to hold when he was little, is now a marriage and family therapist in New York City. He called me recently and said, Dad, do you know anybody that has written about how the really central part of healing therapy is your circle of friends? And I said, absolutely. And it hit me that I'd never told him about Larry Crabb back in the 1990s on into the 2000s. I was so impacted by the writings of a Christian psychiatrist or perhaps psychologist named Larry Crabb. He said that there's just not enough time in a day for every psychologist to keep seeing people. There aren't enough therapists to go around. Oh yeah, they're there to help people and you may well need therapy at some time in your life. But he said the way we tend to think of it is that I, as a friend, as a member of a church, my job is just to rush you into an ambulance and get you to the hospital where the real professionals take over. And Larry Crabb said that's exactly wrong. No, a therapist is the one doing triage for the moment, getting you stabilized, but getting you then to the real place of healing, which is your friends, your church. And he always said that it's there that you find your deepest longing in life, which is for the triune God. In the community of your friends, you find the face of God, the community of God. As I was telling Chris about that, we did a little Googling, and I found out that Larry Crabb just died a few weeks ago. I I suppose of COVID, I don't know for sure. But in a kind of obituary, somebody said he now is in the hands of the triune God that he always spoke of. And I thought, how beautiful is that? Well, it's faith over fear, friends. But today's point is, it's not just your faith in isolation. It's our faith together. We will have courage. We will pray. We will encourage one another. And we will move forward. Our faith will triumph all of these fears we have. And we will ultimately together experience that truth that the perfect love of God casts out fears. Amen. Be blessed.